Hello ladies and gentle sores, welcome to Orbis Pagona, the world of beards. Orbis Pagona is a speculative evolution project that I'm starting, heavily inspired by Alien Evolution series Project Apollo, a sea world in which only cattle, grass, and insects inhabit the entire planet. Like Apollo, Orbis Pagona is also a seed world, a planet that is entirely inhabited by Pagona Viticeps, the central bearded dragon. Before we jump into today's video, I want to give a huge thanks to our sponsor, Mantis Sleep. For all creatures, sleep is essential. It's our time to recharge and heal. With my Mantis Sleep mask, I've found peace and quiet in my bustling home, making naps a dream. Mantis Sleep has a mask for every sleeper, from their classic mask to innovative options like weighted, silk, cooling, steam, and even Bluetooth masks with built-in sound. There's a mask for everyone. These masks are not just comfortable, they're practical. Compact and durable, they're easy to take with you, ensuring you can find rest wherever you are. They're designed to block out light completely, creating the perfect nighttime environment at any hour of the day. Plus, every mask comes with a free set of earplugs, making them ideal for travel or a noisy home. Ready for high quality sleep? Click the link below and use the code MADMEZ for 10% off your Manta Sleep purchase. Here's to a lifetime of better sleep. Many hundreds of years in the future, Human scientists have terraformed a formerly barren desert planet many light years away from our home solar system. They seeded the world with many man-made lakes and seas filled with fish, a diverse array of plant life such as grasses, trees, shrubberies, etc. As well as many species of insects and invertebrates, none of which are larger than the human hand, turning the once wasteland of a planet into a flourishing semi-arid paradise. They did so with the goal to create a hospitable world for humans to live and thrive on when they return to an overcrowded Earth, and set out to the distant desert planet once again with the next generation of humanity. Though, for some reason, they would not return. So, how did this planet come to be inhabited with bearded dragons, you're probably asking? Well, among the scientists aboard the terraforming vessel, many had pets. Though for the first 80 or so years of the voyage, many scientists had cats and dogs, the few scientists that kept central bearded dragons began to breed them and distribute them to their colleagues, and they quickly became the most popular pets on the vessel. Though they were under strict orders to not allow any pets to escape into the terraform planet, inevitably during the humans' time there, a little less than a hundred bearded dragons escaped the vessel. Finding themselves on a semi-arid planet, with an abundance of plant life and insects, and no predators, the bearded dragons of course thrive, and they begin to reproduce with no limitations. Within 1,000 years, the lizards cover the vast majority of the planet. Due to the limited numbers of the initial breeding population, these bearded dragons are all inbred to some degree. Though inbreeding doesn't affect reptiles like it does mammals, diversity among them is hardly present. For many hundreds of thousands of years, the little dragons undergo very little changes in appearance. This period of time, we will call the Vitacene. As for the time being, the whole planet is populated by one species, Pagona viticeps. However, by the mid Vitacene, the amount of insects and plants are no longer so abundant due to the nearly 14 billion bearded dragons that inhabit the planet. Almost 100 individuals per square kilometer. The overeating makes the planet resemble more of something like the Sahara than the Australian outback. The other issue with such a large population, other than the competition for food, is that bearded dragons are very territorial animals. Using their signature black beard and head bobbing to intimidate each other, as well as communicate frustration and dominance. In their native home of Australia, there are many factors that limit their population such as predators, human settlements, and so on. In the wild, their population density is between 5 and 10 dragons per square kilometer. One might think that because they're smaller, they can coexist in more numbers than, say, humans. But because they're so territorial and solitary, they actually require a lot more space on an individual basis. So, the only logical conclusion for this scenario is cannibalization. Adult bearded dragons in the wild on Earth already eat smaller lizards, including younger bearded dragons. This happens in captivity too if you're a fucking idiot. With the now scarce sources of food, the cannibalization of younger bearded dragons becomes far more common. Many bearded dragons become entirely dependent on this, and the diversification of species on Orbis Pagona begins. Bearded dragons that are larger and can eat older and older adolescent dragons are more successful, as they have a greater pool of prey to eat from. These dragons are of course the ones that are selected as mates by females. For context, bearded dragons cannot eat anything that won't fit through their throat. They can tread up things like fruit, bugs, and leaves, but something bigger like a lizard even half their size is too hard to break down. So, the very first speciation to occur on Orbis Pagona is the emergence of Pagona galabis in the latter half of the Vitacene. Pagona galabis 
a relative of the central bearded dragon, is nearly two and a half times the size of its ancestors and features a much larger head in proportion to its body. Its name simply means the gluttonous beard, as it truly is the epitome of gluttony as far as lizards go. This larger body size and head allows them to swallow Pagona viticeps up to a year old, with the oldest of the progenitor species still being too difficult to swallow. On top of preying upon their unevolved cousins, the Pagona galabis continue to also eat their own young, keeping their own population in check. Despite being different species, these two dragons are still within the same genus, and interbreeding is relatively common, creating a hybrid species between the two. This species is referred to as Pagona heterospiculum, which means same spiked beard. These hybrids become common enough to become their own separate species, making now three distinct separate species within the Pagona genus. With this ecosystem of cannibals, the population of the dragons on the planet is cut in half over the course of 100,000 years. Though, for the lizards in their current state, this is still too many individuals to share territory with. With this population cut, we see the return of plants that bearded dragons are used to eating, but their presence still isn't even a fraction of their previous abundance. While most beardies cannibalized each other, some continued to seek leafy greens, flowers, and fruits, which led them to the trees. Bearded dragons are already semi-arboreal, which means that they are capable climbers and often do so to reach food or ideal basking spots, even more so when they're younger. As a bearded dragon owner myself, they simply like to be up high. Excuse, excuse me, Moses, do you, do, do, do you enjoy uh, being up high? Do you enjoy being up high? What about, what about you, Uber? Do you like being up high? I think that's a yes. But they do spend most of their time on the ground because that's where most insects are. The beardies that look for food in the trees on Orbis Pagona slowly over thousands of years become better adapted for climbing and traversing trees quickly and efficiently. This is Pagona sandaris, whose name means the tree climbing beard. These arboreal lizards have developed larger, more muscular hands with improved grip for scuttling up the trunk of trees, as well as the beginnings of gecko-like pads that are slightly sticky. Their diet consists of mostly leafy greens and flowers, as well as fruits such as wild berries and figs, with insects only making up about 15-20% to 20 of their diet. These bearded dragons, being far less stressed for food, very rarely eat the young of other dragons. They lay their eggs not by digging a hole like their ancestors, but rather in the holes of the trees left behind by fallen branches. They further expand these holes by using their large claws to slowly dig out chunks of tree flesh, creating a big enough hole to lay their eggs. Though they are great climbers when it comes to getting down, bearded dragons are not so adept, more often opting to leap off of surfaces rather than climb down. Here on Orbis Pagona, doing so would kill them. So, Pagona Sandaris have adopted a strategy of repelling themselves down a tree using long, prehensile tails. Before descending to a branch below them, they will wrap their long tails around the branch they're currently standing on and hang down from it to decrease the distance between each fall. They do this until they reach the bottom portion of the tree, which has no branches at which point they will either leap or carefully crawl down backwards. However, leaving the safety of the treetops is uncommon. They only do so for their mating season, or they're looking for food they can't find up high. Of course, being on the ground too long runs the risk of being attacked by Pagona galavis. These extant members of the Pagona genus still largely resemble their ancestors. The Vitacine, the first period of life's history on Orbis Pagona, comes to an end marked by an explosion in diversity among not only the dragons, but also the plant life, which we will explore in the next video. Of course, this is a different video from my usual assessing survival videos, so if you guys like this, let me know in the comments and I'll continue to make them. Thank you to our patrons, Kevin Tyre, Jastis, and Mike Yost. If you enjoy the channel's content and wish to get more involved with the channel, consider joining the Discord or becoming a patron. Consider becoming a member of the channel to have one of these little badges next to your name on the live streams and in the comments. Also, you get to use some of these funny little emojis, and the more members we have, the more emojis we can do. So, go ahead and hop on that. It's only like $3. Thank you guys very much, and I'll see you guys in the next one.